Time for the interview. The nice thing about the woman that we are going to be speaking to via satellite from London is that no sphere of human existence, except possibly medicine, is foreign to her. She was the first woman appointed judge in Iran in 1974, in other words, before the rise to power of the Mullahs. She then committed wholeheartedly to defending the rights of women in her country and later in the entire world. And as it is based on the rights of women in a country that we can judge the entire society, she engaged in politics without aiming for any particular responsibility. In the meantime, in 2003, she was given the Nobel Peace Prize, a holy armor that most likely protected her from the ire of the Iranian theocracy. This woman is no other than Shirin Abadi. Mrs. Abadi, thank you for being with us today. You are in London, and we are going to be speaking about some very hot topics because Iran, your country, is engaged in elections. The first question I have to ask you is this. It's a question that looks to the past. Do you believe that the reform candidates are still the embodiment of the spirit of the revolt of 2009, or have we completely moved on to something else? Um, First of all, the elections in Iran are not free, because in all elections, and in particular, in the elections to be held this month, the candidates, all the candidates, have to be approved by the Council of Guardians, and it's the members of this assembly. In fact, they are not representatives of the people, and there are many people who were rejected, whose applications were turned down. 40% of the candidates were not selected, were not accepted. Therefore, the people are only able to vote for those persons who have been selected. And during these elections, there are many reformers, many reform candidates who were not selected. And in order to be able to fill the list of reformers, they were compelled to include some of the Iranian fundamentalists in order to work with them. And therefore, it is interesting to see that part of the fundamentalists who are on the reformers list came and they said, well, we were put on this list without having accepted it. And unfortunately, the consequence of this is that the reformers will get fewer votes. And even under the best scenario, the reformers will only capture a very small majority, and they will have very few MPs, and this will not have any influence on policy overall. Yes, but nevertheless, do you trust the current president, Hassan Rouhani, in order to restrict as much as possible the grasp, the influence that the principalists, the fundamentalists have? Do you trust him for that? According to the Constitution, all powers are in the hands of the guide, the guide of the Republic, of the Islamic Republic, and not the President. After Rouhani's election, the rights have not improved in Iran, and it's only as a result of sanctions, of pressure, that the Iranian president, with the approval of the guide, was able to sign the agreement on the nuclear agreement. Apart from that, there has not been any change, there has not been any progress, and the Iranian president does not have any power. These sanctions that you've mentioned, have they been effective against the regime, or did they mostly hit the population? 
The sanctions put a great deal of pressure on the people and clearly the situation has reached the point where the people in turn have put pressure on the government saying that the emphasis on the nuclear program should not continue. The government's finances have been put under pressure and therefore the government was compelled to sign the nuclear agreement. What's new when it comes to the way in which society is structured? Is, is it still a patriarchal society in Iran? You often say that what's terrible is not the religious authorities, but that it's a patriarchal society. Yes, the structure of the Islamic Republic is based on the power of men. This is not to say that men in Iran have power. They have limited powers, but first of all, the the presence of the clergy in society, in Iranian society, gives power to these clerics who are able to rule over society. I'd like to ask you a question, which is based on a text that you wrote and read out some time ago, and I'd like to ask you whether you still agree with these words. You once said, and I quote, when a person is humiliated, when their rights are uh, challenged, when this person hasn't had real access to education, to real education, then it's understandable that this person should turn to jihadism. Would you still say that today? Do you still think that there are social and economic uh, factors that determine whether somebody turns to jihadism, or does the individual have choice and decide to go in that direction? I did not refer to jihad. I spoke about violent actions. And if there is no justice, if there is no equity, this means that people will move towards violent action and terrorism. I did not use the term jihad, and you have not used it appropriately. <laughs> oh, well, very well then. Uh, but then how would you define the term? Jihad, in its proper meaning, refers to the fact that an individual will go to war against you, against your country, and you will have to defend yourself. Whereas what we are seeing in the Middle East region today, and also in Europe, the violent actions that are taking place, this is called terrorism. These people are terrorists who are killing innocent people people who, and this has nothing to do with a, a military conflict. So what you just said confirms that you are and remain a profoundly a faithful Muslim. Yes, indeed. I am a Muslim and I am convinced that everything that the Iranian government or extremist groups who act in the name of Islam are not representatives of Islam. It gives a bad image of Islam. They're using the name Islam to claim their actions. Mr. Badi, thank you very much. Thank you for the interview that you've granted. As for you, dear viewers, you see how things are at France 24. There's room for everyone in French, in Arabic, in English. Thank you so much for your attention and see you soon. Hello there, this is Live from Paris on France 24. Get connected with France 24 social media. Take the first step. Tweet. Like. Become a fan of. Break away from your TV. 
find another dimension. Become even more linked up to the news with francevancat.com together with our mobile and tablet apps. France Van Cat. Get a connected view of the world.